Hello, everyone. Can you hear me now? Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulty just as we started talking about technical difficulties. <laughs> Doesn't that figure? <laughs> I can hear you. Awesome. Okay, good. Thank you. You'll see some fun facts flashing across the screen. I'm going to take those down because we are at 1030. Awesome. Okay, well, hello. Thank you for joining Denso's virtual manufacturing day event. This is focusing on unusual career pathways for those of you who are joining us live or listening um, at a later date via recording. My name is Nicole Brown. And as we know, unfortunately, life um, this year isn't going to allow us to bring you onto campus and to see the manufacturing world live. So we thought we would try to hold some events virtually for you guys to learn more about the world we live in. Today's panel has employees from around the United States at various Denzel locations and some key items for you to know is that we are being recorded so we can share this on our YouTube channel and then of course, you know, via social media and other career exploration and websites that will launch later, um, later at the end of the month or this year. This site will hold all of our K through 12 outreach material in one place for you. We will have several panel discussions this month, and we hope that you can join um, as many as you can, or of course, listen to the recording at a later date. Also, all our attendees are in listen only mode. So if you do have a question, please utilize the Q and A box and we will try to get to those. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, we will be talking um, with, a, like I said, a few different Denso associates today. Ryan San Vincent, Alejandro Vargas Alrato, and I'm sorry, Alejandro, I know I was practicing, Rochelle Count, Jody Freeman, and Melissa Smith today. They work for Denso in various careers, and they are very excited to be here to talk with you and answer your questions today. Um, I'll tell you just a little bit about Denso really quick, and then we will um, jump to our panelists. So Denso is a global manufacturer of automotive parts and non-automotive products. We supply to just about every major car maker in the world, and we also make robots, and we invented the QR code. So a little fun fact for people that scan those. Um, so I'm going to start and I'm going to introduce each speaker um, one at a time and then we'll go through some basic questions and get into some open items. So, um, Alejandro, are you good if we start with you? Yes, I am. Awesome. So can you just start by telling us, you know, your name, your position and overall your current basic job duties? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, well, like she said, my name is Alejandro Vargas Adato, and I am a senior specialist production engineer for the manufacturing technology division at the Adenzo in Athens, Tennessee. I've been working here a little over three years now. I was first hired on as a specialist production engineer for the monolithic carrier plant as their IoT slash controls engineer. I have been in my uh, current role for about six months now, and my basic job duties involve applying the Internet of Things to all manufacturing areas on campus. Uh, many of my projects involve the gathering and capturing of machine data, uh, first by connecting a, a machine in line to the network, then using other software and programs to communicate to that device to be able to capture and save the data into a database. We then use that data to look for correlations and trends that can be useful to help our current uh, processes, uh, troubleshoot machine downtimes, and sometimes even predict machine conditions or future uh, running conditions of the line. Uh, I also create uh, user interfaces or other screens that the operators use on a daily basis to help them make their jobs a little bit easier. Uh, at the moment, I would say my job's more on the unusual one in the manufacturing field, uh, but I think it's going to become very more common and uh, one of the most common ones because of how useful the IoT solutions have been in helping improve the manufacturing processes as well as the flexibility it gives you, allowing you to do uh, the same thing in many different ways. Awesome. And can you tell us, did you come to Denso um, directly going into IoT and what you just described to us? And did you have um, required education for that uh, field? Yes. yes, I did. So I was hired right after college. Uh, I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas, but I was born in Mexico and spent a lot of time there growing up. Uh, I did go to the University of Texas in San Antonio and graduated with a bachelor's degree in electrical and computer engineering. 
Great. And when you were in middle school and high school, would you say that that's what you knew you wanted to do? Or were you exploring uh, at that time? I would say, uh, especially in early high school and middle school, I wanted to be an architect. Uh, but around that time is when video gaming and YouTube actually started to become very popular. So I spent a lot of my time either playing Xbox 360 and watching YouTube videos. Um, one of the biggest things in the community at that time was actually uh, JTagging Xbox 360s and creating these modded lobbies for Call of Duty. Um, and I found a lot of stuff really cool and interesting. It really caught my eye. Uh, people were basically changing the way that their Xbox were working so they, they could play these games that were modified. Uh, it was so interesting to me that I actually attempted to JTag my own 360. Uh, regardless of the results, uh, I can just remember how fun it was and uh, the learning that I had to do for it um, or going to the store and just buying the components and actually trying to do it myself. Um, it was very interesting and it actually uh, pushed me towards the computer and electric, electrical engineering field. And so as you were just talking, Alejandro, I hear the excitement in your voice, right? I think everybody heard that. So do you yeah. still do you still feel that, you know, working? You know, you're not playing video games, right, yeah. every day anymore. So tell us, do you still feel like that, being in IoT and, and doing the work that you're doing day to day? I do. Uh, a lot of the situations that I'm in are probably problem-solving situations. So that's what really uh, gets me excited, um, especially when you're trying to help the operators to say they're maybe they're struggling, uh, trying to run the line. but the actual struggle is understanding what's going on. So I try to provide them a solution where they can see how it's operating and maybe be able to come up with a countermeasure or something to make uh, them understand that, hey, if I do this one thing, the whole line runs a lot better. So that that's exciting, that that problem solving or winning the game and now you're you're winning at work, right? Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Is there anything else specific you'd like to share or tell us a little bit um, just to wrap up like what your daily work looks like then? So you explain to us, you know, what IoT is a little bit and what that looks like, but what do you do with that all day? You know, you're at work for a good eight hours, right? Mm -hmm. So what does that look like? Uh, so right now we're basically, um, I do a lot of scripting. I've done some programming languages, mostly Python. Um, and depending on the day and depending on the issue that's going on, um, I usually spend most of my day either at the line or at my desk trying to create a script to do something for me. Um, and then so especially on the line, I try to talk to the operators as much as possible to get their feedback and their input um, to see what I can do to try to help them out. Um, I know IoT is basically about machine data and gathering all that stuff and make sure it's connected, but I see it more as how can I use this to make something better and to add on to it. Awesome, thank you. So it's it's good to hear that you're not just having to sit behind the desk all day or stand out on the line all day, but you get a nice mm -hmm. mixture of both. So it's exactly. exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. We really appreciate it. So um, next, I would like to um, move on. Um, Rochelle, would you be ready to go next? Tell us a little bit um, about your current career and um, your name, position, basic job duties. And Rochelle, we can't hear you. I think you're still on mute. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Okay. <laughs> okay, my name is Rochelle Counts. I am currently administrative professional at Denzo in Battle Creek. I am, I've been in that for about three years now and really enjoy that. Uh, I help bring people to Denzo. I've been there for 18 years. So now in that recruiting role, I can help bring people to Denzo. So you said you've been there for 18 years, but only um, in this role for just a handful of years. So tell us, you know, how you started and what your pathway looked like versus Alejandro. He told us he's kind of in an unusual field, right? A lot of people haven't heard of IoT. Um, so tell us what's different in comparison to his story and what led you into your current role. So when I graduated high school, I did attend college for um, a moment, but I found that it wasn't for me at that time. I, uh, I did apply at Denzo as a temporary and started working production. And I worked 11 years in production. And through that and the skills I learned on the floor, I became a sub leader in the final assembly area. And then I decided to 
go back to school and I finished my associate's degree, which led me into other career paths possibly. So one thing that's nice about Denso is uh, the bidding process and the jobs that you can see and the ability to try different career paths. And I saw a position for recruiting, so I thought I would try that. And gaining that associate's degree, I was eligible. And now I'm in that recruiting department. Awesome, awesome. So day to day um, in the recruiting department in that administrative role, can you tell us what your day might look like? What type of things do you do during the day? So my basic role is administrative work. I create associate files. I check rehireability for people that would like to come back to Denzo. Uh, I also um, manage a GED program. So those of you that didn't get your high school diploma, uh, we do offer that at Denzo to come help me with that. But basically, I help the recruiters. I help with orientations and basic needs, administrative needs for the department. Okay. And how does that compare to your role out in production when you first started? What did that look like for you versus the administrative role now? So on the on the production side, I'll agree with Alejandro. I really enjoyed working with people on the line and creating uh, new ways to do things or improve the way we were doing things. That was really very interactive, very, very demanding. Uh, you manage 16 people and, and how you know, they conduct their business and their quality and, and that. Um, but my administrative role is a little different. You're more independent. It's an office environment rather than production, um, you know, the manufacturing floor. Uh, it's, it's more of a paperwork, but when you work with people, bringing them into Denzel, you're answering a lot of questions of what it's like to work at Denzel. What, what can I expect? I get to explain those career paths to them where on the production floor, you're actually working with the person once they're already there. Okay. And would you say that then um, from hearing you say that your experience on the floor has helped in your current role um, in the administrative role in the recruiting department specifically? Has that production experience helped you? So with my production experience, I worked many different uh, in many different departments at Denzo. So when someone has a question, I am able to answer that, and I'm actually able to help a lot of my coworkers in understanding what the area is like out there when they are looking to fill a position for someone. I can help bring that experience I have from the floor to maybe helping that person find a good fit position for them here at Denzo. Okay. And when you were in middle school and high school, what did you want to do, Rochelle? What do you want to be when you grew up? What do you remember wanting to do? <laughs> this is actually kind of funny. I've come full circle because my birthday is actually the week of um, Secretary's Day. So I grew up always thinking that I wanted to be a secretary. And I never did that and never went to school for it. I did a little bit, but then through Denzo in my career path, and through production and going back to school, I have actually landed back into that wishful job that I had as a young child, as a secretary, basically. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> you don't hear that very often, right? A lot of people, you know, have different things they want to be in, then it changes a whole lot. <laughs> as you and, honest, experiences. Yeah. and honestly, I tried a lot of different career paths, but this is ultimately where I ended up and I enjoy it okay. a lot. So just real briefly, before the 18 years at Denzo, then what are a couple of the other things that you did, do, the other experiences you did have before you got to Denzo and where you are today? Um, <laughs> so I did work in a factory a long time ago. Uh, uh, Denzo is a totally different environment and proud to work for that company. It, it definitely makes a difference uh, in how they handle things, how clean they are, the 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 quality of work that you do and the quality of product that you have. Uh, and then uh, I did uh, do childcare. I went into that career path in early, uh, early development education for kids and went down that teaching career path. So I did not ever teach, but I did attempt to go to college for a teaching degree. And I also worked at the big box stores like Lowe's and I did enjoy that. I was administrative work there also, but 
uh, definitely a lot of different career paths. I, I did find that I do like working with people. I also was a waitress for a while, but ultimately I found my way to Denzo and joined that team and have found a, a good work experience and definitely advancement for my career. Awesome. Thank you. And one other question um, to wrap up. So you told us about day to day administratively and you were out in production and you told us a little bit about being a sub leader and in a leadership role. But what did the actual production experience? What was that like for you actually working on the line? And if you had to go back and change your unusual pathway and how you got here, would you change it? Um, do you think that you would be in a different place then? Or would you say, hey, I, all my experiences has taught me and led me to where I am? So I would agree that all of my experiences have led me to where I am today. I wouldn't necessarily change anything because I've learned a lot this way. Being part of the production floor, you, you know how to assemble and you know the things you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it, but you don't always understand the why, your, the why of how you're doing it. And through my management side, I learned a lot about why you have to have those quality issues or quality mindsets and safety mindsets, you know, because as a production associate, you see it as, oh, they want me to be safe. They want me to do quality. But on the management side, you have to ensure that the people are doing that. So it gave me with my production experience, it gave me the experience as a leader to know why and how to explain it to the people why we are doing this. Great. Thank you. And with, oh, well, and also with my experience and then talking as my role now as an administrative assistant, when I do talk to potential new associates, I can give them those experiences that I've had in all kinds of roles and explain their career paths that they do have at Denzel because I actually have gone down those paths. You can relate. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, well, let's move on. Jody. If you would not mind um, starting sharing with us again, your name and current role and a little bit about what you do in that role. Yes, my name is Jody Freeman. I'm a technical instructor. My job is a business partner. I work at the North American Central Training Center in Maryville, Tennessee for DMTN. Um, we do a variety of different technical classes. We teach uh, robotics, we teach PLC, hydraulics, uh, vision systems, sensors, electricity. Uh, we have about 75 different classes that we offer for our employees and our employees that we primarily see here at the training center is level up employees. So somebody that would be hired in off the street and they'd have you know, a good amount of knowledge in electrical, but they may not have much in hydraulics or pneumatics, something like that but apprentices. So we get people that work as production on the floor and they come in and they have a little bit of knowledge and general knowledge of doing a few items, but it's good to always hone your skills and make yourself better if possible. Knowledge is power. By doing that, you're really helping yourself and helping the company. And I myself am an apprentice. I started uh, at Denso 25 years ago. I worked production and I worked production for a year and a half before I got to an apprenticeship. I worked in a starter maintenance division. We make starters and alternators in one of our plants here at Maryville. So I worked there for five years as a maintenance apprenticeship for three, and then I was out as full maintenance for two years. I moved on to a position where I was uh, building machines. So when we talk about building machines, machinery is what puts parts together for starter alternators. We went as far as building equipment for all over North America, Denso affiliates. So I've worked in, the, in about six different plants that I've been into working with equipment. I've been to Athens, Tennessee. I've been to Battle Creek, Michigan, Greenville, North Carolina, South Carolina, Kentucky, West Tennessee. So I've got to see quite a bit. I even was lucky enough to go seven weeks to Japan for uh, some physical training there working, building equipment. About 14 years ago, the opportunity came up to where I could work in main, in, uh, in technical instructing and that's something I always felt like I really wanted to do was work for uh, in a teaching role basically is what I'm in but 
as a technical instructor, it's a little different than uh, just straight up teaching role. So you get to guide somebody, help somebody, but you, you're helping them not just in class, you're helping them in life. That's what you're doing. We try to teach a lot of skills, obviously, that's beneficial to the company, but a lot of stuff that we go over is stuff that will help an individual in life. So they can take a skill set away from here, go home, work on something at the house, and better themselves. Awesome. That very, sounds very interesting and is definitely a, probably a very unusual pathway as well, right? Starting from the floor and now you're in, like you said, a, a technical training position. So I want to jump real quick and, and all your experiences and travel sound exciting too. I know um, I've not yet had that opportunity, but hope to <laughs> have some of those. So could you share with us um, when you were in middle school and high school, Jody, did, you know, where did you want to go? Where did you see yourself? What did you want to do? Well, primarily, I wanted to work as a machinist. I wanted to work as someone in a machine shop building uh, parts, fabricating items. My grandfather was a machinist, and I thought it was one of the best roles ever. You work on uh, very, very minute parts, very, very small tolerances. You have a little bit of leeway this way or that way, plus or minus, if you will. There's a lot of benefits to doing that. However, I kind of got enticed a little bit more into welding, and I... I, I took on welding quite a bit as technical in high school. For about three years there, I took different courses in welding, and that led me to doing a welding, um, what we call Tennessee Applied Technology. Now, it's a tech school after high school. I did that for nine months and completed it as a welder, and then uh, that took me on to work in construction work. And I worked for a railroad for a period of time, and I had opportunity to relocate, and I didn't want to. And so that kind of pushed me into basically starting over, if you will. Welding jobs are, are very good jobs. There's plenty of them out there, but sometimes there may not be one in your hometown. You may find yourself wanting to relocate. At the point in time in my career, my life at that time, I had a young child and I really did not want to try to uproot my family and go somewhere else. So I give Denzo a shot with production and it's been a wonderful decision for 25 plus years. That is awesome. So I'm so glad that you mentioned, um, you know, going to school for welding and doing the nine month certification, it sounds like. So what about then education and training once you started at Denso to get where you are? Did you do that on your own? Um, did you have to go through a lot of formal education versus hands on? What did that look like? Um, and did Denso help you with any of that? Denso is extremely invested in their associates and their employees. Like Rachel was talking about earlier, Rochelle, excuse me, was talking about earlier as far as tuition reimbursement. If you come and work at Denso and you want to advance your learning, you want to advance your knowledge, you have an opportunity to go back to school and get, gather the information to get a degree. And hopefully we want everyone to do that if that's their choice. It's not for everyone. Uh, for me, um, once I got at Denso, Denso invested a lot of time in me and training me in production and then Obviously, whenever I got into the apprenticeship, um, I basically did 1,300 hours worth of training at the technical training center for the maintenance role, the maintenance job, if you will. And again, that went over all, a lot of the subjects that I had. I think I had something like 31 different classes. So Denzo is very invested. I did not have a degree when I come to Denzo. After I got the job as an instructor, because my job was basically classified as an engineering tech, so that was a role that you did not have to have a degree for, but you could advance your learning and you could advance your knowledge. And after you got your degree, that would allow you to move into one of the specialist roles. And a business partner role is the same title as an advanced specialist. So they, re they renamed us a couple of years ago or a couple of months back, I will say, maybe about 18 months ago, something like that. So I was able to gather an associate's degree or equivalent to an associate's degree. They moved me to a specialist and I went on and got my bachelor's in uh, organizational business management. Congrats. So if you would change anything or could change anything in your path, do you think you would do so? And what would that look like and why? I don't really believe I would. I'm very happy with the position I'm at in my life with my family and my work. Um, I feel like the knowledge that I've gained in every one of my experiences, from working for fast food in high school, all the way up to where I'm at now. Um, there is no clear cut path, like it or not, for anyone to walk down. You'll have to make your own experiences and advance yourself. But 
no, I don't believe I would change anything at this point in my career. Okay. And then can you just tell us, um, as a technical trainer now, day to day, what does that look like? What's your day look like? Are you, you know, just standing up and teaching people all day? Or can you tell us a little bit more about what that may be? So today I have three students in class and they're actually working on uh, individual projects as we speak. Uh, the way class started, we left off, we picked up where we left off yesterday and they're actually doing robot training. So we have a manual, a book that we've built and it kind of goes over some of the very important crucial topics that they're going to see and going to use and we kind of use building blocks on it. We'll start small and we'll continuously progress and get them into something a little bit more difficult as they go. But there is a mix of hands on. There's a lecture. Um, obviously, being a technical uh, instructor, you tend to have a little bit more knowledge than what some of the folks on the floor do because they don't really specialize in that one area. We have a lot of individuals that work and they'll cover a variety of topics. I don't specialize in PLCs. I understand PLCs somewhat, but there is much more knowledgeable people than me. So from time to time, I'll get a call off the floor and say, hey, can you give us a hand with this? Sure, and I may find myself doing that. But more than, more than usual, I'm in my classroom with my students. With COVID right now, we're cut down to about four to six students as a max that we can have in our area. Outside of COVID, some of our classes run up to a dozen people. In them, but with equipment restrictions in this particular class, I can only have four at one given time period. So a mix of hands on and lecturing, but it's always a good experience whenever you get somebody and you can go over something and they explain it back to you and makes complete sense. Yeah, it's nice to see that light bulb go off, right? Sometimes. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Could you flip back now and tell us a little bit about, um, you know, when you were out on the floor and in more of the trades type position day to day, what did your work look like? Well, whenever you work in maintenance, your your day is un, un, unchartered as soon as you walk in the door. You, you clock in, you make it to the area, and you may have six machines down, you may have everything running. The machine down, obviously, you go and address it. First thing you want to evaluate is the safety of the area that you're working in the safety of the machinery that you're working on. Then you want to obviously look out for quality issues. It depends. You may be working on a machine changing a sensor. You may be teaching a robot. You may change a conveyor chain, um, rebuild a pump, uh, tons of different things. Once you got into, I got into the machine building, it was kind of like you have, a, you have a list of drawings that you go by and you build the equipment based off of those drawings. You start on the base and work your way up. And the whole time you're trying to make a piece of equipment that'll last a long time and be serviceable when need to be, but will produce a quality part and keep everything into inside of Denso's extremely tight specs. For a, we use that as a as as quality. I mean that's that's something Denso's known for is quality. So you want to make sure that your work is uh, is spot on and you're doing your part to help out with the company. Thank you. Is there anything else about your, your roles and the pathway to where you got that you would like to share now to wrap up before we move um, on to the next person? For me, all I can tell you is knowledge is power, uh, powerful. If you will continue your education, you will continue trying to learn things, that'll help you in life. Um, there's, there's certain certifications that you can look for that sound really good, and there may be some practical knowledge that would carry over to something else. If you keep trying to learn something and you keep trying to advance, you'll eventually you'll get to where you want to be. You'll find a happy place, if you will. You'll find a job that fits your desire. Thank you for that. Appreciate it, Jody. That was a good story. Okay, Melissa, we're to you now. So if you would like to start and tell us, you know, your name and your current role, what that looks like for you. Yes, yeah, so I'm Melissa Smith and I'm based out of uh, North American headquarters in Southfield. I am the community affairs lead, uh, which essentially means that I am responsible for overseeing all of the community outreach our North American locations do. Um, and uh, that really uh, covers Canada, Mexico, United States. Uh, I am also the administrator for the North American Foundation. 
Uh, so I give out the grants via that program. I am a member of the communications team, so I am involved in internal and external communications. And currently during COVID, I am also a member of the North American COVID Task Force. And um, since we're not doing a lot of community outreach, they're using my skills to monitor COVID data in all of the communities and areas that Dunzo operates in. So I am doing data analysis, um, spending a lot of time with the data science team, uh, learning how to do their job. And that's what I'm doing currently. Awesome. Okay. Wow. I have so many questions for you. So <laughs> let's start with, um, let's, let's start and go right down your pathway. So how did you end up here? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I started in Denso in 2001 in the safety, health and environment department. I went to college um, for environmental sciences and fire science. I was a firefighter from high school through college. It's actually one of the ways I paid for it. Uh, but knew I didn't want to do that full time. Um, loved it, but just didn't knew it wasn't that pathway. So the best way to take that experience was to do workplace safety. Um, and I grew up in Maine, so I love the environment. So merging those made a great career. Um, I think the first indication that my career was not going to take a normal pathway was that six weeks after I started was 9-11. Um, and instead of doing traditional OSHA reporting, and materials, we were writing anti-terrorism plans and how to deal with things like anthrax and um, the first round of SARS. And, you know, the first few years, it just was these non-traditional safety uh, pathways. Um, and about five years in, Denso decided that they wanted to do some more detailed environmental reporting in North America. And uh, for some reason, my boss decided that was me. Um, and so I was taken off of safety and put on to environmental and safety reporting for the North American region. So that meant all the greenhouse gas reporting, waste, water. Um, and at the time we weren't regionally reporting. So that was getting everyone to do the same thing, definitions. Um, and we really had a really great system built and we're running that really well. And then the financial downturn happened. Um, so, you know, we think about this. I started out in the dot com bubble, made it up to the financial downturn. Um, during that period, um, a number of people opted to retire, and that actually resulted in the external affairs department being empty. Um, everybody retired, and that is our government affairs and community affairs team. So, that was placed underneath uh, our, our vice president, and then he dispersed the jobs down the chain. Um, and the next thing I knew, I was doing environmental reporting and community affairs, um, and I did those jointly for a while, and then they were able to uh, take away my environmental job so that I could focus on building up the community affairs role. Um, it went from being very localized to what we now have is a regional approach. Um, these panels are a really great example. Uh, this is one of my projects of, of how we can work as a region to do things. Um, so, I, yeah. I just go wherever they tell me to do. Um, and as I said, right now they're having me do a lot of data science. So it looks like I might be on the, the verge of another um, career pivot. <laughs> yeah, you're going to be joining Alejandro doing the IoT work, right? <laughs> There's a rumor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. See, so that just shows, you know, you can go all over. So let's go back to middle school, high school time. Were any of these the things you thought you were going to do or you wanted to do? I didn't even know these jobs existed. Um, as I said, I grew up in Maine and I grew up outside a lot. And so I thought I was gonna be like a park ranger or a game warden. Um, so yeah, no, nowhere near what I thought I was gonna do. Um, <laughs> I think the first pathway towards this though was that opportunity. Um, as I said, growing up in Maine, one of the things you could do was join the fire department when you were in high school. Um, and so I joined when I was 15. And that was really that first introduction to even the concept of there were career paths that I didn't know existed um, because quite a few of the, the men on our fire department were in workplace safety. And so that was how they explained to me there was a career there. Um, so yeah, and it kept me out of trouble. <laughs> yeah, totally different, totally different. Yeah. So what you're in now is completely different than your educational background as well. So yes. how does that affect your current role, if at all? What does that look like? Um, I 
a lot of people mentioned that Denzel has a great uh, tuition reimbursement. So one of the things I did do um, relatively early in my career was actually go back and get an MBA um, since my degree was so environmentally focused. Um, and that way I could um, understand the business side of why are we doing what we're doing um, and what what is the value of my role? Uh, so that was really helpful. And then um, just a lot of ongoing training. I will say that my current role really does merge both my background and my education. So I also oversee Denzel's sustainability approach, which is really our activities towards the UN sustainable development goals. So that's environment, it's community, it's business. Um, and it really does merge a lot of my interest and my experience. That sounds like it. And so a little bit different question for you that maybe I haven't asked from the others and, and maybe um, even Rochelle might be able to talk to this a little bit, but your ability to be flexible and open and willing to change and try new things. I mean, that's really impacted your career and where you are today. And not everybody's like that, right? Some people know, let's say, for instance, you know, they love like Alejandro video games and more IT and network type things, right? And end up in IOT. And so maybe he would stay always more on a technical side of maybe, right? So what do you think about that? Can you tell us, you know, how that looks in a work environment from your experience and from working for a large company like Denzo? Um, being flexible and open has been really helpful. Um, we were joking about it in my department. I'm the department utility player. If there's a gap, I'm going to jump into it. Um, and there are a lot of times, like, even the community affairs role, a lot of people are like, oh, you're perfect for it. I didn't see that. And I wasn't actually wanting the role. Um, but leadership came to me and said they wanted me to take the role because they saw the value. So it's also been really um, important to be open to suggestions from other people on where they think I might need to go um, or what my skill sets are valuable to instead of just digging myself into what I thought I could do. Um, so that's been really valuable of just having that flexibility. Um, and it, as I said, it really helps having a company like Denzo that they're going to help you get whatever education you need to fill that any gaps you might have. Um, but they also, there's a lot of opportunities to put your, push yourself into something that isn't your comfort zone. Yes, there is. And, and then that helps you grow and develop, right? As a person. And I, I have, um, if I were to share personally, I would say, yeah, I've been in some of those situations too, where they hand you something and say, hey, what can you do with this? And you, you try to make it work and you sh maybe show a different skill set. And so that, yeah. that helps you. So that's awesome. So you you did walk us through a little bit about what it looked like when you were in environmental safety type role and and what your um, mixed role looks like now. <laughs> Are there any other specifics you'd like to share with us or with the group or anyone listening that, you know, what day to day you might be doing or working on? Yeah, um, in a non COVID time frame, um, it was rare to find me in the office. Uh, obviously, being community outreach, if I was in the office, I wasn't really doing my job. Um, no offense to my associates, but that's not the uh, community that I was focused on. So I would regularly be um, out, whether it was at a school doing K 12 outreach or um, a big thing for Denzel was road safety. So it wasn't uncommon for me to be on the road going to do. Um, education programs for either teen drivers or even working with our NHRA drivers. We do quite a bit with them around road safety. Uh, so I could end up at the racetracks um, doing videos. Uh, you know, it really was day to day something very different, unusual. Uh, if I was on the foundation, uh, I could go and be gone for two weeks going to universities. Uh, I spent a week last summer driving across Alabama. I went from one end to the other. Um, but saw things I didn't know existed. Uh, so it's not uncommon for me not to be around. And once again, you know, we talk about flexibility. That's another thing. I, you know, didn't have a nine to five job and I have a family. So we had to be flexible in how things um, worked in our household. <laughs> um, and so, you know, it'll be really interesting in this post COVID realm of how we'll start going back to those uh, kind of concepts. 
Very much so. COVID has taught us all <laughs> to be more flexible and willing to change. So yeah. we've all had to learn from that experience. Okay. Well, before we move on to the next person, is there anything else specific you'd like to share or you think that the... I think I got it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Awesome. So Ryan, are you ready for us? Yes. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Thank you so much. So if you could just start, introduce yourself and, you know, tell us about your role and, and what that looks like right now for you. Okay. Um, my name is Ryan San Vicente and I am the CAD operator here at Denso in Athens, Tennessee. Um, my basic job duties for what I got hired on for is pretty much CAD work and handling um, the 3D printer that we have on site. But um, my roles actually morphed quite a bit since when I first started. So I actually do a lot more than what my job description was when I initially got hired two years ago. Okay, so keep going on that, Ryan. What what else are you doing then outside the normal CAD and 3D that you thought you were going to be doing, if you would, compared to two years into the job, what are you doing? Okay, um, like I said before, when I initially um, came to Denso, I thought that the role was gonna just include uh, basic CAD work, uh, drawings, um, handling the 3D printer that we have on site, and that was gonna be the extent of it. But um, due to my past experience and some of the other places I had worked previously, um, my role has expanded quite a bit. So now I have, uh, I have a list here. I'm just gonna read from some of it. You can't see it, obviously. I apologize that I don't have a camera. I actually had to borrow this headset too. They just, they don't have that for me set up over That's here. That's okay. But anyways, um, the first role or title that I fill is, is CAD operator. So on a daily basis that includes uh, reverse engineering of parts, um, any kind of part drawing updates, basically things that are used in the machines to make the product out on the floor. Um, there's a lot of part updates that I get from uh, maintenance or a lot of the production workers out on the line when they are updating the parts, changing things, um, when they don't have drawings for certain parts, maybe the part drawings are outdated. Um, I'll go ahead and handle all of that. So that's the first thing. The second role or title um, that I that I do is CAD administrator. Um, I'm over in the uh, 601 plant. So there's three different buildings at the uh, Denso location in Athens, Tennessee. So I basically support all three of the buildings in terms of anything having to do with uh, CAD work and 3D printing. but uh, for 601, I'm up in the production engineering office, so I handle um, all the CAD administrator work for all of our CAD software. So anything that's computer-aided design, um, we have SolidWorks, we have AutoCAD. Um, those are primarily the two different software types that we work with. So SolidWorks is a lot of 3D work, and then AutoCAD is what we use for our plant layout. So that's all the 2D work. Um, and as CAD administrator, I handle all the installations, all the updates, troubleshooting, and performance issues uh, having to do with either SOLIDWORKS or AutoCAD. The third thing that I do is uh, CAD CAM machining support. So um, CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. CAM is Computer Aided Manufacturing. So it's two different types of software. CAD, you're you're designing things in a 3D space, whereas CAM computer-aided manufacturing, um, that would be a, a software uh, like MasterCAM. That's something that we have here on site in the machine shop. So we have our own in-house machine shop. And um, a lot of times the machinists will come and ask for support specifically for importing when they import files from SolidWorks, uh, having to manipulate those files. And then once they suck that, uh, 3D part file into a CAM software, which would be MasterCAM in this case. Um, so that way they can go ahead and write the tool paths to machine those parts and get those parts out to um, maintenance and the individuals out on the line that actually put those parts back into the machines. So I'm um, the campus-wide support for anything that's SolidWorks, MasterCAM related, um, anything having to do with design for manufacturing issues. And that's specifically, um, is in reference to the fact that I used to be a CNC machinist. So I have that in my background and I know 
uh, what type of manufacturing issues you can run into on the machining side of things and how to mitigate that. Uh, fourth role or title that I uh, handle is for 601 and 801, not 701. They have another engineer that handles their plant layouts, but I handle the uh, plant layout updates for uh, 601 and 801. So both of those buildings, I do all the changes and updates. Um, right now we're having a lot of stuff having to do with cricks. So we're adding a production line and a lot of the machinists, I'm sorry, not machinists, a lot of the engineers, a lot of the production engineers are installing new machines and uh, expanding lines. So um, they're doing some of those updates on their own, but I've got to kind of coordinate all that and make sure that everything's uh, accurate for the plant layout side of the house. The fifth roller title that um, I take care of is 3D printing operator. So basically I have to be the subject matter expert on all things having to do with 3D printing. Um, the vast majority of the things that we do here is, is prototype work or validation of designs that the production engineers come up with to improve their lines. So those areas where they need instant feedback um, so that way they can improve those designs or go through different design iterations to reach their final design. Um, they will go ahead and take a part that they've designed in that CAD software. They'll go ahead and give it to me. I'll send it through um, the software that we have over here that specifically links uh, wirelessly from my computer to the 3D printer, manipulate it in that software, send it down to the printer. Um, and I have to basically choose uh, you know, the best, um, uh, What's the word I'm searching for? Uh, best material. Um, and there's other considerations that I, I won't go into right now, but basically you have to have a lot of uh, part design considerations when you're um, advising on what material to use or how to print it. Um, but we do have a 3D printer on site that handles everything for all three of the buildings, 601, 701, and 801. So all the, print, all the 3D print jobs, they go through me. Um, I handle all their print requests, the maintenance on our 3D printer. We have to have regular maintenance on it to make sure that, it, you know, it doesn't go down just like any of the other production machines on the production line. Um, I have to make sure that I schedule all that maintenance and get it done by Stratasys, which is our vendor. And they also happen to be the 3D printing uh, manufacturer. And then the six roller title, I apologize, this is so long winded, but there's just a lot of stuff that I do here. Um, the six roller title that I have is mechanical designer. Um, so basically what I do is I assist the engineers on any uh, fixture slash part design and I take leads. I take the lead on things regarding uh, the technical design and drawings for um, any of the projects that the PE engineers come up with. Um, anything that's basically design specific and if they want to validate or uh, get advice on or make sure that what they're actually designing or, or what project they're working on is going to work in a technical sense. Um, i.e. machine parts don't run into each other, uh, there's proper tolerancing on machine parts, uh, things work together in assemblies the way that they should, um, and then all the individual components of those assemblies have their individual drawing sheets that go along with them, so that way they can send out their quotes and machine shops won't be looking at the drawings and scratching their heads, they'll actually know, okay, this, this is communicated effectively, I can make this part, and um, they get back something from the machine shop that actually, or machine shop or fabrication shop. So anything that has to do with like welding or machining um, is, is basically where I extend my technical expertise and um, make sure that that's completed in, in whatever design they come up with. And I'm able to, um, you know, do the part drawings for that it actually works in the machine and not just in the 3D space. Cause there's a lot of difference between what you do in that 3D space and what you can mock up in a 3D software like SolidWorks or even in AutoCAD and then what it actually looks like on the manufacturing side of things once those parts are actually created in real life. Okay. Well, Ryan, I have a lot of questions for you too. I mean, my brain was just going that whole time about all the different roles. First, I want to know, do you get any sleep? I mean, do you just stay at work or <laughs> I'm just kidding? <laughs> <with you. laughs> so, I think the thing that probably is standing out to everyone right now too a little bit just about those specifics is the the 3D printing right thinking oh that's probably so cool. So wondering you know like even some basics like how big of a part can you actually 3D print and how long does that take just out of curiosity because I'm sure some people are wondering some of the same things as a fun little fact to add in. Um, let's see just off the top of my head I'm trying to remember I always refer to the 
reference chart from the manufacturer because I can never remember the exact number off the top of my head, but I want to say our build envelope, we work in metrics, so it's millimeters. We're not working off a standard here in the automotive industry. I've worked in, in standard, which is inches and feet, whereas in, in metric, you're, you're working with millimeters. Um, so our build envelope would be 300, a little bit over 300 millimeters by 400 by 350, something along those lines. Um, so if you can envision a cube um, or, or a 3D box, that's that's the build envelope is what it's called. Um, okay. the, the max capacity that our 3D printer can make, uh, yes. Okay, and how long then would it take to make something of that size? Is it a matter of minutes, hours, days? It it really depends. Um, most of the prints that I get from the various production engineers will take uh, anywhere from one to several hours. Although I have gotten some rather big parts in the past from um, from the packaging division, so they come up with these these trays that are really really big, and they'll hold um, either fuel rails. Uh, They'll, they'll hold other, uh, you know, spark plugs or various other parts. But anyways, mm -hmm. those those packaging trays are huge. And in the past, I think the longest print I've ever done was three days straight. Oh, so okay. our our 3D printer does have that capacity to be able to print continuously as long as the material doesn't run out. Okay. So when you were in, in middle school or high school, Ryan, what did you think you wanted to do? Did you see yourself, you know, dealing with? you know, really high tech things like 3D printing and really getting into the drawings and the the measurements. What inspired you to go this way? And is this what you thought you would be doing? Uh, oh, geez, that's kind of a complicated answer, but let's see if I can make this succinct. Um, back in middle school and high school, I, I think I was like a lot of kids. I was into sports. Um, I thought maybe I could progress to the point to where I could um, play sports in college, maybe even become a professional athlete. So that was not my realm of thinking when I was in middle school or high school. And you don't come to figure out until mm -hmm. probably around high school, maybe if you're good enough around college, that that road gets very narrow very quickly. And there's really very few individuals in, in the country or in the world for that matter that are truly elite athletes that can make a living out of that kind of stuff. So that realization kind of came to me mm, probably around 18 or 19 years old. <laughs> and then once I decided that that the realization came to me, okay, maybe I need to pick a real job, um, something that's actually attainable. Um, I, I went to school. Um, <laughs> I actually got a four year degree, believe it or not, in my 20s, my early 20s um, in history and political science. So completely yeah, different field completely different, yeah. in now yep okay and what were you going to do with that um i actually was looking into becoming a lawyer okay but okay. uh did not go that route oddly enough and this is probably going to make a little bit more sense as to how i ended up where i am now um i came from a family of engineers so i had actually kind of been around it um my dad is a software engineer um, and he used to work from home a lot. So I used to see what he would do on a daily basis with programming and um, I, I guess probably some crossover with Alejandro, to be honest, the, the Internet of Things. Um, my dad dealt with software, firmware, uh, all that wireless technology. So he was a software engineer. My brother was an electrical engineer. He still is. Um, and then my grandfather was a physicist. So he used to work for Howard Hughes. He used to do a lot of math and science involved things, but uh, long story short, I, I didn't want to go that route initially. I, I thought I was going to go more on the writing side of things. And then by my senior year in college, I, I really decided I didn't want to do that after all. Uh, I just kind of lost my drive for that, almost like a stutter step, if you will. And um, my grandfather had been in the military and I decided to uh, join the Marine Corps after college. So that was a jump in another completely different direction. Mm -hmm. And um, I was only in for three years. Um, 
and I had initially thought I was going to be in for a lot longer, but once events unfolded the way that they did and I got out of the military, I, I kind of looked around and said, okay, wow, I've got to start from scratch again. You know, I have this degree in something I, I could, I could go to law school or maybe I could try to do something else. And <laughs> excuse me, I think it was just the, the constant, uh, rejection in my mind of the notion of wanting to just have a nine to five. I really wanted to do something that was more exciting. So I, I kind of dabbled in a bunch of different things after I got out of the military, but, um, <laughs> number one, none of it paid very well. Um, number two, none of it really tied back to my military experience very well. And then number three, um, I had actually just gotten married <laughs> and, uh, and my wife had two kids at the time. Uh, we have three now, but um, I had to make a decision quick and in a hurry. Okay, what am I going to do to put food on the table? <laughs> so um, to, again, make a long story short, I, I pivoted and I went to a trade school specifically for veterans where they taught CNC machining. They taught um, how to work with CAD, so SolidWorks. Um, they, they taught me MasterCam, so that's your computer-aided manufacturing. And then uh, I earned several NIM certifications. So that's, <coughs> excuse me, specifically having to do with, um, uh, I'm trying to remember what it stands for, National Institute of Metalworking uh, Standards, something along those lines. Uh, again, the name escapes me off the top of my head, but um, that opened the doors for me to the manufacturing world as soon as I had those certifications. And my very first job after I finished trade school was actually working for uh, Barrett Firearms in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. So that's kind of how I got my start, was was on the CNC machining side, and then I eventually progressed to the point to where my CAD skills uh, had grown dramatically uh, in a work environment, and not just in the schoolhouse. So in practicality, I was able to kind of merge the two, and that's how I ended up where I am now, where I, I do everything from you know, 3D printing, CNC machining, CAD, yeah. CAM, it all kind of, goes together now yeah and with all my those current job role yeah and all those different experiences <laughs> kind of like you know many have shared today have led you to where you are with your current skill set and it sounds like it's something that you've really embraced and you're very talented at so i'm glad to hear all of that is there anything before we wrap up ryan that um you want to make sure that our our students here or somebody you know listening to a, a recording back here um specifically about your pathway um probably the best advice i would give is is keep an open mind to manufacturing um i i noticed that that was one of the topics or, or one of the comments in the in the script here was that <coughs> manufacturing traditionally or at least in the past has been kind of viewed as being this dirty uh you know profession to where you are working long hours. Um, it's it's not paid very well. Um, you're doing stuff that's not very enjoyable. I actually find it to be very rewarding work. And I guess growing up, maybe what steered me away from manufacturing to begin with, coming from a family of engineers, was that there was only getting a degree, a four year degree, and then the only thing you could do from there was either become a electrical engineer, a software engineer, or or some other type of engineer along those lines. And I didn't realize how much overlap there was in manufacturing between all those different disciplines and that you don't necessarily need to go the four-year route four year degree route that's that's the way most people go but if you can just get into manufacturing and get your hands on a machine get into cnc machining get into welding uh, fabrication uh, machine operating machine building like jody was saying get into maintenance i mean there's so much more to manufacturing than just Yes. I feel like what's presented to middle schoolers and high schoolers um, nowadays. And, and there's a lot of different jobs and positions in manufacturing that can be very rewarding and don't fit the mold of, of the stigmatism of what's been shown to them as the only options. There's so much more that you can do. And like what Absolutely. Jody was saying earlier, if you continue to improve and learn from other individuals, sky's the limit as far as what different positions you can hold in manufacturing. And, and some of the jobs do pay very, very well. And Denzo has been great to me. Thank you for that. I really, really appreciate that. You almost did our closing for us. <laughs> so yeah, the, and I would um, absolutely back up what Ryan has said that, 
you know, there are lots of pathways that we can't even possibly tell you all of them, right? We'd be here for days and there's so much opportunity once you get in and get your feet wet and see what you truly aspire to be and what skills you truly have um, in you from experiences you may not have even realized. So um, I do wanna wrap us up, but I do wanna ask, do any of the other speakers have anything they would like to add really quick or any other quick sentence? Are we good to go? Um, I, I probably would just, I'd add one last thing. If, yeah. if you're in middle school or you're in high school, get experience with computer-aided design, whether it's SolidWorks, Solid Edge, um, any other kind of freeware, um, that'll get you interested and exciting in manufacturing at a very surface level. If you can cultivate those skills, a lot of manufacturers nowadays are looking for individuals that are good at working with CAD software. Yeah, a lot and, of technical hands-on skills, absolutely. And 3D printing for that matter as well. If you can get your hands on a 3D printer, if your school has one, um, get knowledgeable with it. Yeah. And anything on the skilled trades and down the technical paths, I would advise that for too. You know, be like working with your hands, problem solving, test the waters a little bit. So thank you everybody so much for attending our session or listening to our recording. Um, we will be having more sessions on different topics. So please ask your teacher, your instructor, what topics are still available to attend. Have a great, safe and healthy school year. Thanks everyone.